Thank you. Um, so good evening and thank you for being here. I know it's uh, kind of weird being via Zoom, but um, I'm very excited to, to be here with you guys. Um, my name is Chanel Dvorak um, and I will be discussing behind the scenes of geologic mapping. Um, a look inside of what geologic mapping actually entails and educating others on field work and how to get the most out of it. So I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen. Um, oh, and you wanted me to say about Women of Geology. So my, I do have a website called Women of Geology. Um, and uh, I started this a couple years ago. I've kind of had it on hold while I've been doing my master's so that I could just focus on one task and, and not be distracted by something else. But um, I've put a lot of work into just being present on social media um, so that women around the world can see other women doing geology um, and feel like that they're a part of it and can do it too and um, kind of just build a community off of that. Um, yeah, so I will start sharing my screen now. Okay. Does everyone see everything okay? Looks good. Awesome. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me here and I will begin. Uh, so here's a little bit on um, my outline. My goal is to teach uh, newcomers about geologic mapping and field work, um, as well as walk you through my personal experience of geologic mapping. Uh, so I kind of go through uh, the list here. And so my personal background, my, again, my name is Chanel Dvorak, second year graduate student at Portland State University. Um, I am so lucky that I have had uh, the chance to map two seven and a half minute quadrangles in um, Eastern Oregon, uh, Jump Off Joe Mountain and Big Canyon. Uh, this has all been through the USGS EDMAP program. Um, so thank you, USGS. And then currently I am working on more geologic mapping in two neighboring quads to the east for my master's thesis. Um, so in total, I've spent over 17 weeks in the field, geologic mapping, teaching mapping, and um, just loving it. It's truly the best thing. I, I think field work is honestly the best thing about geology. <laughs> Um, and then I just, you know, threw in a little disclaimer that this is based on my uh, personal experience of geology and ge geologic mapping of igneous rocks, particularly in Eastern Oregon, such that, that uh, this may not pertain to um, all works of geologic mapping um, or field work, and uh, that I'm just a graduate student and I'm still learning. So uh, I get asked often, uh, how did I get started? Uh, my, the biggest point I want to uh, say is just seek any opportunity, uh, just to get your feet wet, get in there, uh, get it going, because um, that's really how I did it. I first went to the department chair at Portland State University, which is Dr. Martin Streck, and um, asked him if there was any field opportunities uh, for me. And from there, he suggested that I uh, do the PSU field camp um, and, and also suggested to talk to uh, other graduate students and see if they need field assistance uh, just to get a little bit experience that way, uh, which that led to me assisting Dr. Emily Cahoon um, out in her field work uh, on the picture Gorge Basalts. And she really taught me a lot, um, which really set me up nicely for the PSU field camp. And then at the PSU field camp, I was then introduced to geologic mapping, um, which I love. <laughs> um, and then we have to ask, why is this important? 
the goal of this proposed mapping is to enhance our understanding of the geology of an area that is important for questions that concern society and are relevant for the advancement of science. Um, we're aiming to understand the water resources in the Harney Basin in particular. And uh, the proposed mapping would finish the northeast corner of the Harney drainage basin. And knowing the geologic units of this part will be helpful in the assessment of the overall basin wide groundwater flow. So in this case of my mapping, uh, the project will determine rhyolitic petrogenesis in an area previously thought to be petrologically insignificant. Um, which is exciting. Uh, the Strawberry Volcanics uh, TS is the unit that covered nearly, um, sorry, my thing just went, covered nearly the entire map as based on, based on the Canyon Mountain Quadrangle by Brown and Thayer. Um, and then from thesis work from Steiner, as well as myself, uh, we now know that the strawberry volcanics comprise of a broad range of lithological and compositional diverse volcanic rocks, ranging from basalts, cerulites, lava flows, tufts, all throughout Jump Off Joe Mountain and Big Canyon. And uh, just through my recent preliminary week in the field this summer, I am seeing this continuing in the two quads to the east. So location, where are we? Where are we talking about? Um, we are here that my field work, whoops, where's my mouse? So my field work is here out in central eastern Oregon, um, located east of the 395 between Burns and John Day. Um, here I have a map uh, uh, outlining each quadrangle that is or currently or has or currently is being mapped. Uh, so the two years prior to 2017, when I started mapping, uh, there was Calamity Butte Quadrangle and Telephone Butte Quadrangle mapped by former EdMap students as well. Um, then I have started, I did Jump Off Joe Mountain and Big Canyon Quad. And then I am currently working on portions of Logan Valley West and Magpie Table. So uh, the highlighted uh, red star over here uh, indicates the region of study. Uh, this, is, this area is part of the Blue Mountains and the basement rocks of the region consist of accreted island arcs ocean, and oceanic crusts known as accreted terrains, uh, where about 7,000 meters of marine sediment were deposited from early to mid Jurassic. Um, yeah, and then continuing on geologic background, um, this is a map of the main phase Columbia River basalts, uh, where yellow is the lavas, uh, magenta is the dike swarms, green is the extensional structures, and the gray ellipse is, shows the likely location of magma chambers, which are the source of the flows. So here are the uh, accreted terrains I was talking about. Um, the red highlighted red stars again uh, signify the region that we are talking about. Um, and then, yeah, the basement rocks of this area are the accreted terrains. Um, the quadrangle lies within the icy basin, which is a four arc basin, um, and regional uplift occurred in the early Cretaceous due to continued accretion of the Blue Mountain terrains. So here I have um, the geologic map of the Canyon Mountain Quadrangle, um, the large one here. And then in boxed in red is, uh, is my field region uh, consisting of all four quadrangles in here that I've been talking about. And then uh, highlighted over here are those four quadrangles. So Big Canyon, Logan Valley West, Magpie Table, and Jump Off Joe Mountain. Uh, the need for mapping these quadrangles is born by evaluating the only existing map that covers this area. As we can see here, um, most of this mapping area is of this pink, which is TS and strawberry volcanics. Um, but we do know that it is a lot more diverse than we're seeing. 
So grant funding, how do you begin? Um, I, uh, Martin Streck as, and myself applied for the EDMAP grant in 2017 for Jump Off Joe Mountain in Eastern Oregon. And the EDMAP uh, is a one-year mentor guided program designed to teach students geologic mapping techniques through rigorous field mapping. Um, I am so grateful for EDMAP. Uh, they have funded me all the way to, to here. So, um, and then, yeah, here is Jump Off Joe Quadrangle. It's, it's, um, based on the Canyon Mountain map, so uh, where it was all TS. And then here is the finished Jump Off Joe Mountain Quadrangle that I mapped, so the before and after. And we can really see um, the details of how many lithological units there really are. So then I, after Jump Off Joe Mountain, we applied for Big Canyon Quadrangle. Um, we applied and received Received funds for that in 2018, which is also located Eastern Oregon. And then I have to address like, what is a seven and a half minute quadrangle? Cause I asked that when I started. Um, and a quadrangle is a topographic map produced by the United States Geologic Survey covering the United States. A seven and a half minute quadrangle map covers an area of 49 to 70 square miles. So 130 to 180 kilometers squared which is big, takes a long time to map. <laughs> and then, so I have put the Big Canyon Quadrangle next to the, um, its original Canyon Mountain uh, Quadrangle. It does have a little bit more um, lithological units in there, which is the accreted terrains, which you can also see on my drawn map, which is still in the process of, uh, on ArcGIS, uh, so I don't have the finished copy here, but here's my, my paper version. Um, and you, uh, once again, we can see really how diverse the area really is. So prior mapping efforts and reasons to continue with our efforts um, is really due to co the collaboration with previous EDMAP students so that um, our mapping efforts along the northeastern corridor of the Harney Basin began in 2015 and has produced uh, Telephone View Quadrangle, Calamity View, Jump Off Joe Mountain, and Big Canyon, which is in progress. And then we are currently continuing on with Logan Valley West and Magpie Table quads to the east. And then this was my poster at uh, GSA that I think Paul had seen me present. <laughs> so yeah, current ongoing one. mapping efforts. This is, uh, this is the grant that we submitted for this year's uh, mapping, which is Logan Valley West and Magpie Table. I have this distinct uh, black line here because we are only mapping the west portion of each one of these quads. And that was due to the way the grant works, it funds one quadrangle. So we made this one quadrangle. <laughs> and um, we really wanted to do that to highlight the units that are obviously extending out to the east from Big Canyon and Jump Off Joe. Uh, so I summarized the presentation during uh, the 2019 GSA section meeting. And these maps have detailed the geology of the quadrangles with a new array of volcanic units previously lumped into a broadly into very broadly defined units. So some key findings of these two maps of Big Canyon and Jump Off Joe um, really unravel the existence of a mid-Miocene um, large rhyolite field that was also undocumented in the literature before our efforts. So highlighted in blue, we see here, this is all the rhyolites um, found in Jump Off Joe Mountain in Big Canyon. And we're obviously seeing it continuing to the east, um, thus why we want to continue mapping over here. Uh, the rhyolite field consists of lavas and domes with a minor pyroclastic component. We visit the, visited the adjoining quadrangles um, and, I, and I just revisited it last week when I was out in the field. Um, and we do see that there are rhyolites continuing into the east. These rhyolites are mid-Miocene in age, ranging from 16.2 to 14.7 million years old. 
So what's to date? We have um, our maps that indicate a minimum of 12 to 15 individual rhyolite units with more currently being uncovered in the Logan Valley West and Magpie Table quads. And based on our dating so far, ages ranging from 16.2 to 14.7 uh, indicate that rhyolites belong to a recently recognized rhyolite flare-up associated with the main pulse of volcanism of the Columbia River Basalt Group. Um, these rhyolites are a part of the strawberry volcanics and therefore important as they demonstrate that the rhyolite flare-ups uh, reached further northwest than was known thus exceeding the footprint of the rhyolite flare-up. So how do we begin mapping? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about setting goals and field preparation. Uh, so how long do I need to be in the field to complete this task? Uh, scheduling field dates um, and then scheduling that and finding assistance for the field. Uh, however, usually we have plenty of undergraduate students at PSU that are very eager to join in and help. So that helps a lot because we need the help. <laughs> and come on. Sorry, my computer is not wanting to change slides. Oh, there it is. Okay. So sampling unit organization is very important when you're starting mapping and doing anything with field work. So a big way to stay organized is the way you name your samples. Uh, I figured I would put an example of how I do it. And this is how I've stayed over the last four summers um, uh, uh, naming all of my samples. So I use my initials. Um, the year, then the initials of the quadrangle, and then the sample number. So for example, it would be Chanel Dvorak, 2019, Big Canyon, and sample number five. Um, and then recording units and field notes. Uh, this is also very important. I use the Avenza mapping app on my phone. Um, which is super nice and handy. And I record every stop that we take, um, as well as I use my paper maps it, to record it further information. And I just have a copy of everything twice. So I put it in my phone and then I put the same information on my paper maps. Cause if you were to lose one or something, you want to have it all. <laughs> um, so we use a sledgehammer to break open fresh surfaces of the rock outcrop for analysis. Um, a brief description of the rock uh, being analyzed along with any significant geologic features in the area, I will note in my field notes. And then I also take photos of the rocks, the fresh surfaces that we've broken open, and then a full photo of the outcrop. Um, I note always if a sample has been taken. Uh, recording the sample number on my uh, paper maps as well as in Avenza. And I um, and then, yeah, I put the numbers down there as well. So then to talk a little bit about a Venza Maps app. So it's an application you could download on your phone. Um, I know that there's a couple different kinds, not of a Venza, but ones of um, uh, Strabo Spot is one of them. And I had, can't remember the other name um, of different geologic mapping apps out there and they're super helpful. Um, I got used to Avenza, so that's the one I've just stuck with using. Um, and here's a little walkthrough of how you would use Avenza. So you would start by, down, we'll download the app, and then you would start by downloading the maps needed. So you have this little store icon and go to like topographic maps or whatever maps that you're looking for. And then uh, you must have an internet connection to download the maps. But once you have the maps downloaded, you don't need any connection because it will just use GPS, GPS to locate you in the field from there. So it allows you to record notes, uh, take photos, um, and all by adding this little place mark. So these are the little place marks that'll drop you on your location. Um, it's this little icon down here that I have circled in red um, has the pin that you would press to drop your pinpoint. 
And then the little arrow here, it locates you where you are. So sometimes there's like a little lag in GPS or it's gonna like jump a little. Um, so I always push that right before I drop a place mark to make sure it is where I am. Um, and then there's also um, ways to change the coordinate system. So down here at the bottom, you have your coordinates. Um, but if you are used to a different way of looking at it, you can jump over, you can open this bar and, and click any other ways. There's also uh, this GPS tracking and navigation tool, which is really nice. Uh, you can see your uh, degrees here. And I like to also look at my altitude, especially when I'm hiking steep areas, just see where I'm at. <laughs> And then recording data onto paper maps. Uh, so this is very important as well. You can't just do one without the other. You, you need paper maps as well as um, recordings on your, on your digital device, whatever that be, GPS or uh, iPad or apps. <laughs> so at camp, post my field day, I record my findings onto a separate paper map. Um, I had broken the map into quads, like separate little quads within the quad to uh, help organize what I was gonna tackle each time I went out in the field. Kind of broke it up for me and made it more attainable. And then we also do this similar, similarly to uh, for the PSU field camp. So when field camp goes out there, we will break little sections off for them and they will just map the area given. And then I also print a forest roadmap of the quad and I get this from USGS on their website. And then I, as I drive these roads, I color which roads are good uh, to indicate accessibility. So often if there's like a big road, but I can't actually access it, I'll put, you know, like a red line through it or something. So that when I return and I need to like fill in some holes on my maps or my professor wants to go check something out or students have questions that we can easily find our way back to that spot. Um, then you have your full quadrangle map. This is the clean and clear of camp mess map. So you want it, you want it away from all the dirt. <laughs> and this is where your detailed recordings go. Um, and then these are your paper maps that you have out in the field with you. So you can obviously tell these have gotten real dirty and sweaty and gross. Um, <laughs> and they are to be kept inside your map board and noted while you're in the field. So gear, the fun stuff. <laughs> um, I wanted to suggest things that I have found super helpful uh, throughout my experience in the field. Uh, as this being my fourth summer, I have definitely worked out some kinks and little tricks to make things go a lot smoother. So for my backpack, uh, a hip belt is extremely important, for me at least, because when you're carrying all those rock samples, your bag gets really heavy and it starts to kill your shoulders. So it's real nice to have that support below. Um, my gear capacity of my bag is 40 liters. And then I carry a four pound medium handle length sledgehammer. And I only take a sledgehammer, not a rock hammer, because I'm dealing with igneous rocks and they're very hard and a rock hammer does nothing. <laughs> So in the easy to access zippers on the backpack, I like to have my hand lens and then I had put which hand lens I personally use. Uh, you want biodegradable toilet paper, wet wipes and hand sanitizer, which I have in a bag. You definitely need your, your toiletries ready to go. Uh, sunglasses with a strap because I have lost multiple sunglasses out in the field. So the strap is very helpful. Um, a compass. Uh, blister care, which is not just for me, it's also for field assistants when they come out often having, not having any field um, experience. It's really nice to have that blister care ready. Uh, a handkerchief I keep on the outside. Uh, this has come in handy more times than I can explain. It's like stopped bleeding, it's wiped up sweat, it's <laughs> all sorts of things. It's one of those items that I don't know why, but it really comes in handy. Um, and then I store my backup uh, Ziploc freezer bags in the front of my backpack and then in the easy to grab side pocket sunscreen and bug spray. 
continuing on my bag, um, I carry a three liter water bladder, um, which I go through every day. We hike five to or seven to 10 miles a day when I'm in the field. Uh, so three liters is definitely what you want if you're doing that excessive of hiking. Um, I also want to make sure that I have plenty of bag space for collecting samples. Um, so I leave, I only put this stuff in my bag and then I have this, all this room here for samples. I bring a rain cover for my bag, uh, emergency supplies, first aid kit, KT tape, rope, and then a little duct tape. Um, and then in my little zipper pouch here, I bring feminine products, uh, energy supplements, and hand warmers. So I'm huge on safety. I really want to make sure that everyone is safe in the field and being so far out with no cell phone service, you know, the closest hospital is an hour plus away, um, especially if you're in the field and you got injured and you have to carry someone down or assist someone down, um, you definitely need to be prepared for the worst. So I take this very seriously and I bring in my little hip pouches, uh, any medications needed. So like personal medications. So I bring my inhaler, uh, salt stick chews. So on those really, really hot days, uh, it's really replenishing, uh, protection. So I carry either a taser or a handgun with me in the field. Uh, and then I bring bear spray, uh, chapstick, uh, body glide for anti-chafing, which is really nice, especially even on those hip straps. If you ever have felt the, the straps rub on your waist, that stuff works really well for that. And then I bring a collapsible extra one liter water pouch. Then uh, my first aid kit, which is the most important one, <laughs> I bought the, the packaged one from REI that already comes with everything in it. But then I did add some items I added water purification tablets, extra band-aids, anti-itch cream, infection protection cream, tampons, and waterproof matches. And then in my little emergency uh, bag that I keep inside my backpack, it folds up real small and nice and just sticks in the back of my backpack. Don't even feel it. But I keep a headlamp with extra batteries, backup shoelaces, uh, emergency blanket, EpiPen, a small wilderness first aid guidebook, and a life straw wa water filter. So safety, accidents happen. <laughs> here is my array of accidents uh, pictured here over the last four summers. Um, we've had car troubles, flat tires, dead car batteries. I did unfortunately hit a deer. That's what this sad face is for. <laughs> And then I've had injuries, which I am currently have an injury right now, and then uh, different blister care and stuff. So it is really important to take uh, safety precautions. So then talking about my map board, what I have on me in the field. Uh, this is crucial for geologic mapping. Uh, it's directly where we put our maps into. It holds our road maps. It's essential for holding our notebooks and it gives you something to write on. So I uh, made my own using wooden clipboards and just like ripped off the clips and taped it together with duct tape. And I used bright yellow duct tape so that I can see it against the dirt <laughs> and um, attached large rubber bands and loose and then paper clips to hold the notebooks and stuff in. And that has worked great. Uh, and then my field vest, which is just like your typical fisherman vest, um, has been, I think, my number one purchase that I've made out of anything. <laughs> it is everything that is uh, you use constantly in f geologic mapping just right here. Uh, so uh, it has many pockets for the loose items. So holding the colored pencils that you'll be using for drawing on your maps, which I've lost a lot of colored pencils, but this has helped a lot. <laughs> and then your, your sample bags with your uh, Sharpies ready to go. It holds my vehicle keys. It holds my phone. Uh, say if I need chapstick or something, I could just throw a little chapstick right there. It's everything that you don't want to have to like constantly be getting in your bag for or, like rummaging for. Super easy access and it's very breathable. Um, yeah, so 
that is what I wear on me in the field. And then I wanted to talk about items that I keep in my field, field vehicle. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. <laughs> um, I keep bungee cords in there, uh, which have often come in handy for strapping garbage to the roof to take out garbage when I'm done with the week. <laughs> um, fluorescent orange hats, I do wear those in the field. Um, I find those very important, especially for later in the season, uh, around September which is when um, hunters are in the area and I really want to make sure that they see me and don't mistake me for an elk or something. So um, I have me and my assistant wear uh, fluorescent orange hats. Uh, boot gaiters I bring just in case, backup rock hammer, sledge, chisel, shovel, heavy duty gloves. Um, I bring a machete and collapsible handsaw. Those have come in handy for when I'm on um, all these back forest roads and trying to get past some branches, uh, different things that have fallen over in the road um, is when I've used those. That's why I keep them in my vehicle. I bring a road safety vest for when I'm along busier roads doing road geology. Uh, backup Ziploc bags and then toiletries. So kept in my spare tire well is a spare tire with a jack toolkit. Uh, jumper cables, first aid box, tire chains, tire pressure gauge, and a fire hydrant. But most importantly is the jerry cans on the roof of my car filled with extra gasoline. <laughs> um, I personally have a vehicle with a smaller tank, so I carry another full tank of gas on top, which I have actually needed to use one time. So it's a nice little, you know, security blanket to have with you, especially when you're out there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> So setting up camp. Um, these are my personal suggestions on gear that I have found that have just made life in the field a lot nicer. Um, the importance of a good night's sleep. So I really like this REI camp bed. It's a 3.5 camp bed, very thick. Um, and you honestly can't feel the ground, which is really nice. And you're able, so after your long hiking day, you can actually uh, get a real good night's rest. And then a tent that actually has some space. So um, not necessarily those huge like 10 person tents or something, but I use a three person tungsten tent. It gives me enough room to have all my uh, clothing for the week and also have any books or whatever else I'm using to do my uh, field mapping and reporting when I'm back at camp um, and then my bed and whatnot. And then water at camp. So having an actual little water jug at your camp, instead of having to go to um, the spigot every single time you need water for like your pots and pans or anything. And then a real heavy duty um, ice chest, which I always buy ice blocks and uh, that stays for the whole week, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, so sleep and comfort, um, tent necessities, um, just still suggesting some things that I have found are, that are super helpful, is a garbage bag, because your stinky field clothes, you don't want those just sitting in your tent. <laughs> um, small garbage bag for trash, extra batteries, a few lights, um, yeah, and clothesline. Uh, bed necessities, a thick sleeping pad, sleeping bag, a, be a bag liner is nice to bring, especially being out in Eastern Oregon where it's the desert and at, some nights can get very cold. So it's a nice backup to have. Um, and then yeah, warm sleeping clothes. So for cookware and dry food storage, uh, highly suggest storage bins with lids. Uh, the chipmunks uh, go crazy for, for stuff. <laughs> I've had them steal my forks and, and food and whatnot. So these are some things that I suggest to put in those bins is cutting boards, plates and bowls, cooking pots and pans, a kettle for coffee, cups, silverware, and then other um, miscellaneous items. And then in your dry box, uh, spices, hot sauce oils, uh, shelf stable, creamer, canned and dried items, etc. And then I have to 
take note of gear with the sole purpose of having fun. Because I really do believe when you're out in the field, you should really make the most of it. Um, so when you finished your field day, you're able to relax and have a good time. And one way that I really do that is I always seek out water holes or somewhere, some form of water to swim in that also helps bathe me. <laughs> and, um, and then I bring books, uh, different foraging books. I bring crafts such as knitting or woodworking, bring my hammock uh, and then like a portable speaker for music. Oh, and of course beer, all of us geologists, we need our beer. <laughs> so here's like one of the swimming holes I found. Here's Dr. Martin Streck. Woo! <laughs> We're at a swimming hole out in Eastern Oregon. Then here's some hot springs also. And then even joining in at local events. So I went to the John Day Rodeo. Um, I like to just make fun with what I have out there. So post field season work. Uh, organization is key. Uh, you must categorize all bag samples by unit type. So I will take all my samples and lay them out on tables and then categorize them all by unit type. I'd be sure, I'm sure to write a list um, in my field notebook of these sample numbers and what category they're in because I will refer back to that constantly. Um, then picking which samples are worthy of geochemical analysis and or age dating, we decide these candidates um, based on how fresh they are, which meaning like uh, least weathering um, and different things like that, or big enough sample, yeah. So I have a couple pictures down here of um, crystal picking for age dating, sieving, uh, cutting rocks with rock saw, and then uh, thin section. So optical mineralogy and petrography are a big part of um, completing these maps. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we pick up these samples and we think it's one thing and then I put it under the microscope and it's totally something else. <laughs> so it's uh, definitely the best backup tool in geologic mapping. Um, we select appropriate samples to cut into billets using the rock saw. And then we send the billets off to a lab to be made into thin sections. Then when I receive those back, I begin my optical analysis um, while writing a detailed log of each thin section. Uh, then when I'm uh, doing this, I'm also taking pictures of significant features and of the whole thin section as a total. So geoanalytical goals. Um, I acquire additional geochemical and geochronological data on selected samples collected in the field. Um, these pictures are of at uh, Washington State University Pullman campus at the Geoanalytical Lab where I conducted um, preparing samples for XRF and ICPMS. Um, then we do um, also some samples we take for argon-argon age dating. I do have a video link down here um, of a little video I put together for um, of the whole XRF process from beginning to end. I just like sped up through it. We can watch it or we don't have to. We can, it, it can be a click on later. Um, all right. And then um, I asked at the beginning all of, of this for myself is what is XRF? What is ICPMS? Um, that was all very new to me. So XRF uh, spectrometer is an X-ray instrument used for routine chemical analyses of rocks, minerals, sediments, and fluids. And then ICPMS um, is used to measure the concentrations of rare earth elements and certified standard reference materials, including shale and coal. And then I have a little more material on uh, deeper on what they are. So producing a map at the end of all of that. So all your multiple weeks in the field, all your uh, analyzing, all your geochem data is processing. Um, you want to start taking your field drawn map into arc map. So you'll begin by drawing polygons in arc map. Um, as well as um, making your description of your map units, uh, deciding which colors are appropriate for each uh, unit, 
and then uh, producing your cross section, which is always the last item I do just because so many kind of things can change and shift and uh, I want to make sure what I'm producing is making sense for the map. Um, and then Big Canyon Quadrangle is still in progress. Uh, so this is all for Jump Off Joe Mountain. And then you, re you uh, complete an analytical report. So here's my a picture, at least, of the front of my um, analytical re report for Jump Off Joe Mountain. Uh, this is what I then submit to USGS. Um, and then I'm in the process currently of uh, generating my Big Canyon Quadrangle report. Um, and then I just put a little quick layout of like, what does that report entail? It has an introduction, geologic background methods. So like a typical uh, lab report, but then it's adding explanation of map units by category of flow type, and then further broken down into detailed unit categories. Uh, then we do talk briefly about faults um, and how that affects the area. Uh, conclusions, and, and then of course, just your acknowledgement, reference, and appendix. So in conclusion, I am working towards defending my master's thesis by winter term 2020, uh, which is rhyolites of the Strawberry Mountain Volcanics, evolution of a major rhyolite field associated with Columbia River basalt magmatism. And my expected products are compilation of all rhyolite units and map exposing these specific units, petrography and mineralogy of strawberry rhyolite units, uh, determining if the rhyolites have different ages and mapping the extent of the rhyolite flow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Boy, that was wonderful. Oh, good. I, I can't think of 